Hello and welcome to this webinar uh, on acute cholecystitis in the elderly to do or not to do, which is brought to you by Estes, the European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery. We want to make this as interactive as possible, so please ask any questions as we go along through the Q&A button. We will try to answer them during the webinar, either directly with a written reply or as part of the panel discussions. If there are a number of similar questions, we'll probably put them together and ask, answer them at the same time. And if you ask a great question that we don't have time to answer, we may even send you a reply by email afterwards. There will also be a number of case presentations and interactive polls. All voting will be anonymous, so please don't be reluctant to take part. We'd love to know what you think. My co-host today is Shahin Mozaini, Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Örebro in Sweden. And we have four great international panelists who in order of appearance are George Pereira, General Surgeon from Viseo in Portugal and Chair of the Estes Section of Emergency Surgery. Abe Fingerhut, who amongst other things has an international reputation as a teacher and laparoscopic surgeon and currently holds appointments in Graz, Austria and Shanghai, China. Christian de Virgilio, Professor of Surgery at the UCLA Medical School and Chair of the Department of Surgery at Harbour UCLA Medical Center and Dennis Kim, Associate Professor of Clinical Surgery at UCLA School of Medicine, Medical Director of the Intensive Care Unit at Harbor UCLA. It's good to have you all with us. Thank you very much for joining us. I would like to hand over now to Shaheen to present the first case. Shaheen. Thank you, Dr. Tilsit. Let's see if I can make this work. So here we go. So I'm gonna jump right into the first case. And it's a 88 year old female that presents to an outside hospital with pain in the right upper quadrant for two days. She has also fever and nausea. She has a medical history that is MI eight years prior to this admission. She's on anticoagulation for arrhythmia, several medication for hypertension, including beta blockers. She is morbidly obese with a BMI almost 60. She was also admitted two months prior to this admission for an upper GI bleed that didn't get any intervention more than a gastroscopy. One month after that and one month before this admission, she was admitted for a COVID-19 infection and that was also a supportive care. She's severely frail, mostly bedridden, no prior abdominal surgery, and she was deemed to have an ASA classification of four. Her labs at admission was a severely in, uh, increased white blood count and a C-reactive protein of 182. Her liver transaminase, bilirubin, amylase, and lipase were all normal. She did a CT scan, which showed that she had a acute cholecystitis and one single large gallstone. After contacting us and she was accepted for coming over to our department, but when she arrived, she was in septic shock. She was hypotensive, hypoxic. She had an elevated lactate and a blood gas. So we started her on the sepsis bundle with the IV fluids and oxygen, IV antibiotics, which was already started from the referring center. And she was admitted to the ICU where, they, where she was in need for vasopressors as well. So the question is, how should we continue? Should we continue this patient conservatively and go for a cholecystic? cholecystostomy tube or take her to the operation. So what do you think? Okay, so we'll end the polling there. And as you'll see, almost two thirds of the audience would go for a tube cholecystostomy. Um, 
21%, just over one in five, would continue with antibiotics. And a minority, just over 10%, would go for cholecystectomy. What do we think about that panel? Not another one. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's continue with the case and see what happens. So uh, this patient was uh, unstable, so we decided to go for the conservative treatment to see if she turns around. On day two, she was more stable. Her white blood count decreased and uh, the CRP increased. At that stage, we went for the cholecystectomy tube. She's still in hospital and this is her second week and after talking to both the patient and the relatives we decided that she's not a candidate for operation even if she comes out of from this episode of acute cholecystitis and it was decided to have a dnr decision on her so that's how we manage this patient how was the cholecystectomy tube put in on the vocal anesthesia? Yes. Trans hepatic? Yes, it was done on the local anesthesia uh, ultrasound guided. Trans hepatic? Trans hepatic, yes. Even though she was on anticoagulation, okay. Yeah, but we reversed her as best as we could. Okay, any other comments from the panel? George, would you do that? Manage the same way? So George, you uh, need to unmute your microphone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for that. I was saying that uh, probably, yes, I, I do agree with this, with this, uh, with this management, uh, despite cholecystostomy is not a really good uh, option, but probably in this patient was the only option uh, to do something for her. And yes, I agree. I would do it like this, probably. Okay, Christian, would you do the same? Yeah, yeah. I had a question. You know, uh, given the high white count in the prior study that we did, we found that that level of leukocytosis was associated with a much higher risk of gangrenous cholecystitis. And so the question is the timing of the two versus, you know, how long do you try antibiotics uh, versus a, a more aggressive tube approach? Because I, that's the one thing is, how did you know that this patient was going to turn the corner with antibiotics? And we didn't. And the thing was that uh, our anesthesiology uh, wouldn't uh, give her general anesthesia. She was in septic shock at the time that she arrived. And uh, obviously she was anticoagulated. Uh, that was one reason that we didn't go for a cholecystectomy tube right away. And then we got more information as we talked to the relatives that she's severely frail. So we just made a decision that this patient wouldn't be a fit for a surgery from the anesthesiology point of view and getting her back to her uh, normal life would be very, very difficult, uh, given that she was a high-risk patient also for uh, complications for pneumonia. And the COVID-19 was also in, uh, in the calculation where the studies have shown that these patients do a little bit worse when they are intubated. No, I, I agree with your management. I think that the tricky thing is trying to decide the timing of the cholecystostomy when they're not clinically improving with the initial approach? Uh, uh, when, I, when I take care of these patients, there is very, very seldom that I go with a cholecystostomy tube, extremely seldom. And this is the first case for me this year. So there should be an absolute contraindication for operation in my book. Okay, and you've decided to put your tube in. How long are you going to leave it in before you take it out? If she doesn't remove it herself, four weeks. Anybody? Uh, Shane, Shane, 
do you perform some kind of uh, cholangiogram through the, the tube before you, you move it out? Not normally. What would you do, okay. George? Uh, I usually do a cholangiogram. Um, if um, if the, the, the bladder is not uh, communicating with the, with the, um, with the bile duct, uh, I probably will remain with a, with the mucus fistula, and it will be some somehow troublesome. And probably we should go for surgery in the fit patients. Uh, this one is an unfit patient. Probably I will leave the the, the, the tube uh, more time. Okay. Beyond six eight weeks. Uh, I was going to make a comment. I agree with uh, Dr. Mosaini that you know we're we're not and uh, Dr. Kim, please comment. We're not big fans of the cholecystostomy tube at Harbor UCLA ourselves, and uh, you know we recently looked at a national database on this topic and found that patients who have cholecystostomies have overall long-term higher mortality complications and readmission rates, and so we try to avoid cholecystostomy at all possible, but I agree in this patient with, with their ASA class and their other comorbidities, uh, coli was not a good option. Okay, so we have agreement with the panel and actually agreement with the audience because that was the choice that the vast majority made. Okay, Shane, should we move on to your second case? Sure. Jonathan, may yeah. I just... Uh, just uh, please uh, to all the panelists uh, have a look at the question and answers and feel free to reply directly to our attendees that are making a lot of questions. Thank you, Aito. So continuing with the case number two. This was an 83-year-old gentleman uh, presenting today ED with two days of right upper quadrant pain. Uh, depending on uh, whose assessment he had localized right upper quadrant peritonitis or generalized peritonitis. He was on Coumadin because uh, previous DVTPE. He had a CHF, diabetes type 1, and mild dementia. He had prior open appendectomy many years before this admission and an ASA classification of 3. His white blood count at admission was 21. His CRP was 190. The liver enzymes were marginally increased, but normal bilirubin lipase and amylase. There was an ultrasound done from the ED that showed acute cholecystitis. When I saw this patient, he was in a lot of pain. Uh, he, he, he had local peritonitis, probably generalized as well. So there was a question if you should uh, manage him conservatively, uh, the tube or take him directly to the operation. So what do we think? Um, let me just get that right. Okay, so in this particular case, the majority of the audience would go for a cholecystectomy. About two thirds, about a third would continue with antibiotics and a small number would go for a tube cholecystotomy. Show him what happened in this case. So after reversing his uh, anticoagulants with portrombin or his uh, uh, comedin, we went for an operation. And this patient, as you can see here, he had a perforation with bile in the intra-abdominal space. Probably that what was giving him the peritonitis. It was 
a very, very inflamed gallbladder. It's the cystic duct you are seeing here. And in these cases, I usually use the harmonic because these are easy bleeding patients. Here in Sweden and uh, definitely in our center, we always do the cholangiogram profitably. And when we see that the anatomy is intact, we divide the cystic duct after uh, putting clips in the proximal part of the cystic duct on the stump. And as you can see here, this was a very, very bad inflamed gallbladder. Postoperatively, this patient got antibiotics IV for three days. The lab normalized and he was discharged home on day three. Dr. Kilsett. Okay, great. So would the panel agree with the uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy as management for this patient? Would anybody disagree within the panel? Yeah, I, I agree here that uh, this patient, number one, had uh, clear peritonitis, uh, very high white count, uh, and uh, I think that trying to do a cholecystostomy, as I said, is, is likely going to lead to trouble down the road. And mm -hmm. uh, these are very difficult, but I think in a, an experienced center, this is the best approach. Okay, again, we have uh, quite unusual agreement amongst the panel and with the audience. So should we move on, George, to your presentation? Yes. Uh, uh, can I just make a... Uh, a slight comment about the, the case, because this this is uh, uh, this is a case that is is uh, appearing more and more in our emergency department, and if we have some way to reverse anticoagulation in patients that are in uh, cumarinic uh, ther therapy. Uh, when we have the, the, the novel anticoagulation, anticoagulators, things get a little more uh, complicated. And I, I would like to, to ask to, to, to the, the, the colleagues present, what is your strategy when you have a patient that is in, uh, anticoagulated with, uh, with NOAX? So we see a lot of patients coming in on the novel oral anticoagulants in addition to just warfarin. I think as many of us have seen, there's really been an uptick and the trend seems to be more going with the DTIs or direct thrombin inhibitors and the anti-10A agents as a method for anticoagulation. So I think a lot of it has to do with how urgent or emergent is the operation. And then why is the patient on the actual antithrombotic therapy? And those two things together usually dictate the rapidity as well as the timing with which you're going to reverse them. And so depending on which agent it is, um, if you need to go quickly and it's like in the last case, warfarin, then probably going with the four factor prothrombin complex concentrates the way to go. You know, for some of these other agents, especially for the anti 10 a inhibitors, they can be extremely expensive on the order of $10,000 a dose. So I don't think any of us would be using any of these reversal agents in those cases and just wait it out because the half-lives of a lot of these drugs after about 12 hours really start to go down. But we are talking about elderly patients, and so they will have a little bit of prolonged time in terms of uh, circulating effective drug. But uh, in terms of antiplatelet agents, aspirin, Plavix, we usually don't worry too much about those when it comes to doing a lap coli. And for the last two cases, you know, I think conservative therapy really isn't an option when someone comes in with this. And it's interesting because uh, both Dr. D. Virgilio and I are interested in hyponatremia. And I haven't seen a salt value for any of these patients, but we've actually looked at this and found that that's actually a very good predictor for the presence of a gangrenous cholecystitis. So 
in this last case, I was kind of asking myself in my mind, what was the serum sodium on admission? Okay. Okay, George, does that answer your question? I, I, I really didn't want it an answer. I wanted uh, uh -huh. That uh, it, it would be, it will be explained to 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 the audience because it's it, it's very it's a very important question, mm -hmm. and it's coming more and more to our emergency departments, and uh, um, and uh, I notice that a lot of surgeons don't know how to manage this kind of, this kind of patients and particularly this kind of therapy. It's just for that. So, if you don't mind, I will follow with the presentation. Okay. So, we are going to talk, we are talking about cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis in, in, in the, the, in the elderly patient. And, um, my role is to somehow make the defense for the surgery as soon as possible. I have no conflict of interest to report. And uh, the main cause of acute cholecystitis, as all we know, is, is cholelithiasis and, and uh, its incidence increases with age. The complications also increase with age and, and that is particularly uh, curious because uh, these complications uh, turn more severe as the age uh, progresses. Acute cholecystitis is, in fact, the most common complication of, of uh, cholelithiasis, uh, and uh, means that there will be a more complicated surgery because uh, uh, it will be technically more demanding than in elective, elective surgery. Cholecystectomy eliminates the problem, eliminates the bladder, and eliminates uh, at the same time the, um, the stones. Uh, uh, it's in fact the most common operation that the general surgeon does in all over the world. Um, for the treatment of cholelithiasis, laparoscopy is today the gold standard, as low morbidity and mortality. Uh, the main issue was some years ago in the beginning of the laparoscopic era, the, the fact that there, are, there were uh, a rise in bile duct injury, but with uh, the learning curve that is uh, disappearing, and it's not really a major problem now. We, we have a problem with, um, with the concept of, of elderly because um, multiple studies work with multiple uh, thresholds. We have the uh, World Health Organization um, definition that is 60 in the low-income countries and 65 the high-income countries, but there are also many, many papers that address uh, patients with more than 70, some more than 80, and now today also uh, the super elder that is more than 90. So we stick to the 65 because most of the, of the studies are uh, using this threshold. Uh, we know that acute cholecystitis in the elderly um, has a higher morbidity and mortality than the younger patient. It usually has a more severe presentation and a more later presentation, delayed presentation of, of the, the acute cholecystitis. And if we had the, the, particular, uh, the particularity of these patients having more comorbidities with the AZA superior to three or a Charleston superior to six, like uh, in, in the Tokyo guidelines is addressed, uh, we know that we are going to have very complicated patients and frequently associated with sepsis. When, when the acute cholecystitis starts, it's is, uh, mainly an inflammatory uh, process and it progresses to turn in, into a, an infectious one. 
and uh, uh, when it turns infectious, the, the installment of sepsis is, is very easy and, and, and rapid. So uh, according to the Survival Sepsis Campaign, we treat the sepsis with, with, with the, the known bundles, but with the thing that is uh, the source control. And we know that um, to do source control in acute cholecystitis, we have to eliminate the source of the infection. And most of the times uh, it's uh, only in, in, the, in the gallbladder. And so uh, we have to do something to, to that to really do a source control. Because if we don't, sepsis is going to evolve and, and the patient could uh, eventually die. One way to, to perform this source control is performing acute uh, 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 laparoscopic cholecystectomy. But um, the treatment of acute cholecystitis not always was um, a cholecystectomy in, in the beginning or earlier in the course of uh, acute cholecystitis. The classic approach uh, was to start with a conservative treatment with antibiotics and leave the, the process to cool down uh, until the inflammation subsides and then do a delayed surgery, eventually a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. This approach does not uh, address the, 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 fo the focus of the infection and has, in fact, no effective source control. Uh, many patients uh, end to uh, run well in their course, but uh, there are some patients that will repeat the, the acute cholecystitis or even don't have a, a good course and need to have an emergency cholecystectomy. In the last years, there was proposed another approach, the, ap the approach of early surgery because it provides an early recover and an early discharge. And as we are going to see, probably is not very different in terms of um, morbidity and mortality. This choice is really not uh, very, uh, is very controversial. And the controversy is fed by the countless papers that are published comparing early surgery with delayed surgery or even other, other options. Most papers show the results of retrospective studies, but there are also some randomized controlled, controlled trials, but um, the conclusions are really confusing because not a single paper uh, agrees with the conclusions of the, of the other. So for some, early surgery is really better, and others argue that early surgery has higher morbidity or higher bile duct injury, and it's really difficult to uh, draw some conclusions for, uh, from reading only the papers. For that reason, um, in, the, in the last decades, there were some groups that gathered the conclusions of uh, most of those works and made some uh, reviews and meta-analysis and despite the different conclusions, conclusions that they could uh, take, most agreed that early surgery is better, or at least it's not worse than delayed surgery. In 2013, the Cochrane, the Cochrane Collaboration also participated in a, a meta-analysis that says that they really didn't find any difference in their primary outcomes between early and delayed surgery, but they noted that early surgery has at least uh, an, a short hospital stay. Later in 2016, Song from China, from Chongqing in China, um, stated that most meta-analysis are discordant and he picked up most of those meta-analysis, he, he, he chose the ones that were uh, more qualified, that had uh, better uh, quality, and he, 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 do, he did a meta-analysis uh, of himself. And as you see in, in, in the table that is depicted, 
uh, here in, in, in this slide, um, there is um, the results really appear to be favorable, favorable to early surgery because most of the results or doesn't uh, show any difference uh, and it, that is uh, provided by the yellow squares or they, they show some benefits and that is provided by the, the green squares and the blue squares are the only ones that show some benefits to delayed surgery and appears to be only in the duration of surgery and uh, in the post-operative drainage. So in conclusion um, of, this, uh, of these studies, I think it's time to think about this issue very seriously and uh, start to have a defined mindset of what we are going to do. For, uh, because we, for a large group of academics and clinicians, there is a strong evidence to support their early cholecystectomy uh, is better and should in fact be considered the gold standard for acute cholecystitis. That is also what the, the main guidelines uh, existing nowadays and updated recently say that um, acute cholecystitis should be treated with early cholecystectomy. They do not agree uh, with the, the specific time, but uh, the time is around 72 hours. Some, some go until to 10 days, but all of them agree that early cholecystectomy should be done. Early cholecystectomy is, in fact, showing a shorter length of stay, a early recovery. It's cheaper in terms of hospital and social expenses. Patients report a significantly better quality of life. And in the, others, the other um, variables, the, the results are not really um, concordant, uh, but some uh, of the studies find that morbidity is lower, the duration of surgery is also lower, and there, there are really no difference in the conversion rates. Furthermore, to support this, uh, this position, we know that uh, the conservative treatment fails and uh, one third of the patients need to go to emergency surgery for that. Most elder people that uh, are treated conservatively never get to be <laughs> really operated. Uh, some studies say that only 25% of these patients go to surgery uh, in, in the delayed form, of course. Most of these, many of these patients, around uh, one third to, uh, to half of these patients, will need some treatment for some kind of complication of the cholelithiasis, and some of them uh, need, in fact, to be operated because of a new uh, uh, acute cholecystitis um, episode. So, in cl conclusion, like the master said in 2015, in conclusion, early cholecystectomy should be offered to the patients because it's the, it presents the best outcomes and the least cost and should be considered in uncomplicated acute cholecystitis. The question is, should it be offered also to the elder? And uh, um, if, ye if yes, what is the timing of the acute the, the cholecystectomy that sh we should do in, in the elderly people? And if not, what are really the options that we have to treat this, uh, this population? We know that is a fast growing segment of the population with a natural history of symptomatic lithiasis that is sev more severe than in younger patients and is usually associated uh, with comorbidities that worsen the prognosis. And we also know that the risk of recurrence in this, in this particular patients bring, brings the risk of a severe presentation uh, and a worse outcome if the, the disease is to appear again. So we have to treat these patients with a, a, in a methodical way so we can somehow um, uh, 
taking account this, this possible complications. So the options are really the options that we have in the younger patients. Uh, the delayed surgery, the percutaneous cholecystostomy, and the surgery with, the surgery with all of the, uh, the versions that we can use to diminish the, the, the morbidity of the, of, the, of the surgery. Regarding the conservative treatment, um, I'm just going to say that the conservative treatment is now being studied in a randomized controlled trial with the support of the Cochrane collaboration. It started in 2016 and it's due to end in December this year. So we can, we surely will have new information in the end of this year uh, about this particular um, topic that has not been addressed um, uh, in accordance and uh, in the right way in, in the papers that already exist. Relating to the percutaneous cholecystostomy, I would say that after the publication of the chocolate trial, the overenthusiasm regarding cholecystostomy has subsided. And I think, like uh, the literature, that it should be reserved for a very selected group of cases, mostly patients with sepsis and that are unfit for surgery. Really, regarding cholecystectomy, uh, there are several studies that have already proven that laparoscopic cholecystectomy is safe in the elderly. Some groups even studied patients with more than 19 years, 90 years, and they came to the same conclusion, cholecystectomy via laparoscopic uh, laparoscopy is safe in, in the elder patient. But uh, there is an important uh, um, question about the, the surgery in, in the older patient, that is the need for an adequate selection and preparation of these patients with involvement of a multidisciplinary team that is very important in these patients that present with multiple comorbidities and uh, that have in fact uh, particularities that are linked to the frailty of these patients. There are also many papers that uh, um, address early cholecystectomy in uh, acute cholecystitis in the elderly patient. And much like the, stu the studies that are for all ages, the final cl conclusion is basically the same. There are some points that uh, could be uh, advantage and some others that uh, are uh, open to discussion. But at least the short length of stay and the avoidance of recurrence episodes are uh, um, advantages that the literature points out also in the elder population. The World Society of Emergency Surgeon and, and the Italian Surgeon for the Surgery in the Elder have the, um, at least to my knowledge, the only guidelines regarding acute cholecystitis in the elderly patient. And they also recommend uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the early in the course as soon as possible and especially in the first 10 days from onset. It is important to emphasize that the need for preparation and uh, selection of the patients is important before carrying out surgery. Moreover, there is a need uh, for having the proper logistics and experience to commit with this endeavor because it could be a technically demanding surgery uh, uh, because of the delayed presentation, because of the, the severe uh, a picture of the acute cholecystitis that we can uh, often found. Conversion to open surgery, subtotal cholecystectomy, and the other techniques that are used to lower uh, morbidity, particularly morbidity regarding bile duct injury, are indicated in the elder as are indicated in the young patient. Probably are more needed in the elder, uh, given the more severe presentation and the time of evolution, and as I said before, uh, the more demanding uh, uh, technique of this uh, 
surgery in these patients. So early cholecystectomy in the acute cholecystitis in the elder patient is possible and it's preferable, but we have to select the patients that are fit for surgery. We have to assess and prepare the patients because of their multiple comorbidities. We have to have the logistics and the experience because of the technically demanding possibility. And we should uh, uh, involve early uh, multidisciplinary care and have uh, personalized care to these uh, particular patients. So in conclusion, I would say that surgery as soon as possible for acute cholecystitis in elderly, unless the patient is unfit for surgery, as we uh, could assess by the ASA score or the Charlson comorbidity index or the classification of the Tokyo uh, guidelines. We know that we are going to have a shorter length of stay. We are going to have lower total expenses and we know that the patients are going to say that they have better quality of life. Possibly there will be also a gain in mortality in surgical site infection and in bile duct injury, but um, these variables are not so, uh, um, so supporting in, in the literature, so there is some controversy around them. So this is what I wanted to say in defense of the uh, uh, early cholecystectomy, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, George, for that uh, excellent presentation. I have to ask you the obvious question. Um, selection criteria is important, and you've said that these patients should have uh, cholecystectomy unless they're unfit for surgery. So how do you define being unfit for surgery? In uh, terms? I would say that uh, uh, a patient that is an ASA superior to four, or uh, as a Charleston comorbidity index superior to six uh, could be a patient to, um, to think, think it over about having surgery. I think this is uh, mainly the, the, the same uh, uh, the same guidelines that the Tokyo guidelines from 2018 use. They use a little less if the patient is septic and that is understandable because a patient with sepsis is more severely ill, and so uh, we have to we have to accept uh, Charlson morbidity index lower than in a, a non-septic patient, but a patient that has a lot of comorbidities and has um, uh, a surgery for uh, a very severe disease probably are not going to be, uh, uh, there's not going to be an advantage to operate these patients and probably is better to use other uh, option like the cholecystostomy or even just treatment with antibiotics. Thank you, George. The rest of the panel agree with that as the cutoff point for those patients that should not have surgery. Yeah, I, I, I agree with a uh, very excellent presentation, by the way, Dr. Pereira, a uh, really nice thorough review. Um, I had a one question for you. Uh, let's say the patient comes in at, at midnight. Uh, we want to get this operation done expeditiously. Do you proceed and do this operation at one in the morning or do you wait till the next day to proceed? Um. Uh, that's a, a, an excellent question and thank you very much for it. Uh, usually, I think um, that a patient that has an uncomplicated um, acute cholecystitis and that has favorable um, markers like uh, uh, leukocytosis and uh, CRP or even procalcitonin, that is a marker that we, we use very frequently. Uh, it can wait, it, he, he can wait until the morning, but th if the patient has a high leukocytosis, uh, is instable of uh, hemodynamically or uh, has a um, 
an altered uh, level of consciousness, for example, we operate uh, as soon as possible. I don't know if there is any question, more questions? <clears throat> okay, I think you've answered them. Let's take the opportunity to move on to uh, uh, Professor Fingerhut. Abe, if we could have your presentation to put perhaps the, uh, probably not the, uh, the opposing view, but certainly the case for a delayed surgery. Okay, um, I'm not so sure I'm gonna go in that direction, but uh, let's uh, see uh, what I can come up with. Um, the topic was a little bit different uh, the two times that I got the topic uh, proposed to me, so um, I sort of make a, an, uh, a combination of the two, and I'm going to talk about uh, what should be done if the conservative or supportive treatment fails. Uh, sorry, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Let me start again. Okay, I hope this is... That's worked. It's working. Nothing's working. I'll go this way then. Um, we've heard that uh, acute calcicitis in the elderly is uh, associated with substantial mor mortality, especially if it goes untreated. And uh, there is a higher perioperative mortality. And we've heard also that there have been recommendations made, the so-called the Tokyo Guidelines. The first version was in 2007, it was revised from 2013, and then recently in 2018. I'm quite a little bit critical about these uh, guidelines, as I was when I spoke about this in the American College of Surgery a couple of years ago. Um, there hasn't been much change in what we call the severity of the Tokyo guidelines. Um, three grades going from mild to moderate to, um, to severe, um, even though they're uh, listed here in the uh, opposite order. Um, everybody would agree that severe um, acute calcicitis is essentially based on the fact that we have some form of organ failure, whereas the moderate um, uh, acute calcicitis has uh, uh, clinical signs that are uh, uh, in indicated uh, with a high white, um, a high white um, blood cell count. Sorry about the telephone. Get that off. Um, the uh, other uh, uh, remark that I want to make is that um, these uh, uh, criteria have been the same from the, the Tokyo Garden 13, 2013 and up to 2018. And then, based on these, uh, on the severity, we have uh, they, the Tokyo guidelines have come up with recommendations. So I'm gonna go very uh, quickly through the grade one, which doesn't really uh, uh, change things uh, that much, except that many people don't even give antibiotics. Um, the grade two, however, has a, in the flow chart, has a, um, an indication that when antibiotics and general supportive care are not working, um, that we should go to a urgent or early a drainage procedure, um, basically uh, a calcisosomy. Well, um, yeah, let's take a little look also at the grade three, when either we have a poor performance uh, uh, status or we are not in the so-called advanced center, or when there are no um, um, FOSF being the favorable organ system failure, in other words, reversible organ uh, failure. Once again, the recommendation is to go for an early uh, or, a, or an early uh, drainage procedure. Well, I have some questions, and uh, I'm very happy to see that in the previous talk, uh, some of these questions were already brought up. Um, first of all, supportive care. 
Um, everybody talks about supportive care, um, but no one really defines it except for acute cases like we saw in, in sepsis. So is it basically oxygen? Is it basically antibiotic? Is it basically um, fluids? Uh, this has not been really defined, but I guess everybody has their own protocol. And then the question that Jonathan asked, how unfit is unfit? Something very difficult to estimate. And um, I would agree that uh, if you uh, think about it, uh, I don't know if there's a much difference between doing a, a, a calcisostomy or a calcistectomy in a patient that's unfit for surgery, it's unfit for surgery. Well, I think the question is we have to talk this out to the, with the family, with the patient himself, if it's possible, and to see what they want and uh, make sure that the patient that is so-called unfit to begin with uh, becomes a little bit more fit for surgery. I think that the Tokyo guidelines uh, have a certain amount of contradictions that we have to um, deal with. First of all, they say that calcistectomy should not be performed for patients with symptoms lasting more than uh, 72 hours, which is joining uh, the talk that we just heard uh, from George. Um, we do know that um, this is possible. And there's even a randomized trial from Switzerland that has shown that, uh, among others, that uh, it is possible to, um, to do a, a correct calcistectomy even if it is over 72 hours. So this is not uh, a, major, a major problem today. Contraindications also say that, uh, in the fact that we just heard about, that early laparoscopic calcistectomy is better than late or delayed laparoscopic calcistectomy. Uh, even in the elderly, as we have heard, I've only mentioned two studies, but we've seen that there's many more studies that say, say the same thing. Um, even when the, the Charlton uh, index is, is higher uh, than three or six in total guidelines. And even when the, the uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists score is, is high. There is a study from London published in Surgical Endoscopy in 2018, well, in UK, let's say, uh, that did come up with a very, very uh, good paper um, uh, saying that laparoscopy uh, resulted in a 84% risk, uh, relative risk reduction in 30 day mortality as compared to open surgery. And that index hospitalization calcistectomy in this population, even though the immediate mortality was slightly higher, did prevent further episodes of the gallstone-related disease. It reduced the readmission rates and was associated with lower morbidity and lower overall health costs, healthcare costs. So I'm going back to the Tokyo guidelines that uh, I think are really too restrictive, that one size does not fit all. Laparoscopy is safe for patients, even with a, a CCI uh, that as high as six, over 70, even with then stage renal disease, and especially in the acute uh, calcistitis setting. The rest of my talk is going to be based on what is a, what the Tokyo guidelines call the bail out procedures. But I have some, some questions also to, to raise there. When you uh, entertain then, laparoscopic calcistectomy and you encounter difficulties. There have been many, many publications about what should you do. And we heard that open conversion was one of the options. I'll talk about that in a few seconds. The other options being a subtotal uh, calcistectomy of which there are two types, either leaving the, the, the remnant open called the fenestrating uh, subtotal calcistectomy or some people still perform what is called a reconstituting uh, subtotal, uh, subtotal calcistectomy. And then there's the reversion to the, what Strasbourg has, has been against uh, and rightly so, um, but sometimes we have to do the fundus first uh, procedure. 
And uh, Andy Peitzman, um, among others, has also described what he calls a semi-top-down, or other people are talking, or a middle-first um, um, polycystectomy. All this is uh, different, there are different manners to make sure that there are no bile duct injuries or at least reduce the risk of bile duct injuries. I'd like to say that conversion is a big problem for me. The literature is very confusing. Bile duct injuries have been reported to be over much more higher after conversion, but we're even 100 times more in a recent paper. But we're looking at a very, very difficult problem because is, are these patients being converted because there already is an injury or is it because of the conversion that there is an injury that's not really very clear. People have even gone to the point of saying that there are surgeons today that have less experience with open colostectomy. This, this might be one of the reasons. I, I'm sure I don't agree with that. Um, Consists of some the, the, the percutaneous uh, version. Um, there's no formal evidence that uh, percutaneous calcisostomy is better, especially in the elderly or in the critically ill. And as we've heard, about one fifth of these patients will require an emergency calcistectomy after having the TC. The one, that one third have a uh, complication, severe complication, when the calcistectomy is finally performed with an increased risk of bile duct injuries. And as we've heard the, the chocolate trial, I think we cannot come to any conclusion on that trial. That trial was, was uh, actually terminated early after about 138 patients were reviewed um, because of the obvious um, high complication rate and, and, re and re operation rate in the percutaneous calcisostomy group. Moreover, we have to realize that um, calcisostomy impairs patient mobilization. It requires a dedicated radiologist. We've heard that some people do, some people do not do a, a cholangiography. And as I heard also very, I, I agree with the, sometimes in the patient that is so-called unfit for surgery, that, that tube's gonna stay in for the rest of their life. It does require multiple daily flushing, at least twice, sometimes more. I'm not so sure that people are very honest when they say that this procedure can be done under local anesthesia. In, in our hospital, more often than not, the patient will require some form of sedation, intubation, and it doesn't end up just as a, a local anesthesia. And then, as I alluded to before, there are contraindications, at least relative contraindications to the transhepatic route, which is much better than the uh, per uh, per uh, um, I'm sorry, the intraoperative, uh, intraperitoneal uh, route. Um, and those uh, coagulation orders, uh, the disorders that we were talking about is a possible uh, contraindication to that um, transhepatic route. Another thing that we don't realize too much is how often do we have to reoperate after these bail out operations? Uh, Calcistostomy up almost 50%. And this has been reported in more than one paper. However, for a subtotal uh, calcistectomy, the, the reoperation rate is much later, is much lower, sorry, and it's essentially when uh, the reconstituting subcalcistectomy is being, being performed as opposed to the fenestrating variety. And when it is performed, it's a difficult operation. Um, it's possible to do it laparoscopy, but uh, the uh, difficulties are enormous. So my last slide is going to be about the indications for interval uh, calcistectomy after <clears throat> whatever procedure or whatever attitude you have come up with. Um, the Tokyo guidelines say that a interval calcistectomy should be performed four weeks after the initial uh, treatment. 
specifically after Kausa um the uh, opinions vary from nine to nine days to over a little over a month to over three months for some. However, once the decision to operate on uh, has been taken, the difficulty does not seem to be uh, that much, and laparoscopic uh, calcistectomy has been performed has been performed successfully in a um, fairly a good amount of uh, cases, as you can see the the two series that I came up with here on this slide. So, in conclusion, I think uh, we have. Uh, basically the same opinion with George that the early uh, laparoscopic calcistectomy is the ideal. Uh, you concluded that this was for the uncomplicated uh, acute calcistitis. I think I would add that it's even sometimes for complicated uh, acute calcistitis that uh, early calcistectomy, yeah, performed laparoscopically is the ideal uh, treatment. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Abe, for that uh, a great talk. Um, so we have a consensus really that for the majority of elderly patients, what we should be doing is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Is there anybody on the panel who would have a different view from that? Um, I'll chime in. I completely agree. I think uh, some really great points have been raised regarding risk stratification. And I think the one thing that I would really encourage people to think about is you know, not just age as a number. Uh, we have talked a little bit about the Charleston comorbidity index. You know, frailty and use of the frailty index is something that one can consider. And for our residents and our program here, we always encourage use of the ACS, American College of Surgeons, NISQIP risk calculator, which in fact takes into account ASA class as well as immobility level of dependence, and then actually spits out a number that kind of gives you a sense as to the risk for specific complications as well as morbidity and mortality. And in that way, we can have a more informed discussion with the patient and their loved ones. And I think a lot of the, uh, you know, what Dr. Fingerhoff brought up about the PERT cholecystostomy tubes is absolutely right. Um, they are finicky, they are bothersome. And, you know, we oftentimes get referrals to operate on these patients when they have a recurrent episode or complication from their biliary tract disease. And it is made so much more difficult when there's a PERT cholecystostomy tube in there. So again, I think that's really like when we think about shunts in trauma surgery, that's a damage control procedure. It's a bailout option. And ideally these patients should be going for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move things on at this point because we still have some fantastic stuff to get through. So Shaheen, could you present your next case, please? Uh, Dr. Fingerhoff, do you have to? Yes, sorry. There you go. So moving on to the case number three. A 74 year old female presented to the ED with fever, nausea, and two days of upper quadrant pain. She has hypertension, which she takes medication for. She's obviously on uh, anticoagulant for her arrhythmia and also low dose corticosteroids for PMR. She has previous story of lower midline laparotomy and hysterectomy, and she was classed as an ASA pre. On admission, this is a Saturday evening. Uh, this is a patient that is uh, that has a BMI of 38 with right upper quadrant tenderness. She had increased white blood count, mildly increased CRP, but significantly increased ALP, AST, and ALT. 
with a bilirubin of 40. That's an increase also. The ultrasound confirms the cholecystitis, but the CBD could not be visualized. It's important to mention also she had a CT two months prior to this admission where there was no sign of cancer. So the first question for the audience is, would you do further radiology or not? And which the response from half the audience is that they would do an MRCP, about a third would do a CT, and about a fifth would do no further investigations radiologically at this stage. Being a Saturday and being at our center, this I'm gonna come back to, we didn't do any further radiology. This patient had obviously um, cholangitis based on her lab and presentation and she was admitted. So the next question for the audience is how to manage this patient further at this stage. And most people would go for ERCP, but a fairly close number uh, would be a conservative management with antibiotics. Okay. But the initial management for this patient was that she was admitted with antibiotics and fluids uh, and observed closely. And as you can see, her labs deteriorate and her infection got worse during the Saturday. And I have no good comment on why they didn't do the operation on Saturday, uh, Sunday, but on Monday when we saw the patient, we decided to change the management. But I would like to hear what the audience would do in this case. So all of her labs are increasing and especially the bilirubin. She's still stable and uh, she's uh, subfebrile and nothing else going on there. And she's admitted to the ward and she's not admitted to the ICU yet. Okay, so just over half of the audience would still favor an ERCP with a cholecystectomy with an ERCP, a fairly close second. So we went for the operation and obviously there was some challenges because she had uh, a lot of adhesions, but uh, I decided that uh, go on with the laparoscopic uh, surgery and see how far we could get with that. And it says all, always the um, saying that you can never tell how it looks on the inside from the outside. And uh, as I mentioned before, I usually use the harmonic in these cases. Uh, I think it's very useful because it's less bleeding and better dissection. So after dissecting the gallbladder, this is how it looks like around the pot area. Here's the reveres. So what would you do in this scenario? Would you continue laparoscopically, convert to open, put in a drain, 
and go for an ERCP or just do the ERCP. So the majority, almost half, would continue with the uh, laparoscopic procedure. Just over a third would convert to an open cholecystectomy. 10% uh, would bail out with a drain and 6% would go for an ERCP. In this case, uh, we uh, continue with the laparoscopic approach and obviously we had in mind that there is a high chance that we have to convert this patient. So obviously you cannot see any critical uh, view here, but I can assure you there was some at some point. Uh, putting on the sling and doing the incision in the cystic duct and performing the cholelyangiogram. Uh, and this is why we not always go for the MRCP at our hospital because we do cholangiogram in all our cases. And here's what we found. We found distal uh, stones in the CBD. So now this is the question, how to proceed from here? Would you do a laparoscopic CBD exploration, open CBD exploration or on table ERCP or continue with the cholecystectomy and do a post-operative ERCP? A much more split decision on this one um, with about a third doing a laparoscopic common bile duct exploration, a third doing an on-table ERCP and a third doing a post-operative ERCP. So we decided to go with the on-table ERCP and this is how it's performed here. We do the rendezvous technique and uh, through the cholangiogram catheter we go down with a guide wire and here you can see our ERCPs and the, the guide wire goes through the cholangiogram catheter which is then docked into a loop and all the maneuvers from here are done over the guide wire. Doing this rendezvous technique, there has been several publications that the risk for accidentally cannulating the pancreatic duct decreases and so does post-operative or post-ERCP pancreatitis. The papillotomy is performed. Once again, uh, the guideway is there. And then the balloon cleansing of the CBD. And we retrieved four stones in this particular case. After that, we go on with our cholecystectomy, uh, putting clips on the cystic stump, dividing the and gallbladder from the liver surface. And in the usual manner, just putting it in the catch bag and removing it. So post-operatively, this patient was fully mobilized. Uh, she had antibiotics IV for three days and was discharged home on day three. So. Okay, thank you, Shaheen. Um, one of the questions that I will put from, from the audience, um, the patient had a high probability of a common bile duct stone and clinical cholangitis. So if you're not going to do uh, a, a, a common bile duct exploration, uh, why not do a preoperative ERCP? 
exactly what I would be saying as well. Yeah. Uh, so that question is to me. Uh, here in uh, Örebro and uh, most of the places in Sweden, the ERCP is actually done by the upper GI surgeons. And the gastroenterologists, they are not in-house during the weekend. So getting the ERCP uh, is not the same patient flow as, say, for the other countries. And with the data out there right now, the rendezvous technique is much more safer, deemed safer, for post-operative uh, pancreatitis. And these patients would eventually get the cholecystectomy as well. So we go for them um, all in one. I think it probably explains the fact that the difference that we've seen in the polls reflects probably uh, ability of resources and experience. I think the essence is that everybody would manage these cases in a similar way depending on what they have access to, whether it's their own skills or the skills of uh, uh, an endoscopist, a gastroenterologist, or whether they're available at the time. And uh, comments it, from uh, a Abe, you said that was a question that you would have asked yourself. Yeah, I mean, that uh, the, the traditional attitude would have been the RCP uh, from the start, but um, as we have heard, um, we have the definitive treatment as well uh, being performed at the same time, and the overall result is uh, is, is is the same. Um, however, uh, perhaps with an ERCP and then a planned cholecystectomy, um, the suspense of having the right treatment <laughs> being performed finally would have been a little bit shorter, but. Uh, Overall, I mean, I, I think we, we come out we, we come out with the, with the right answer and, and the right therapeutic uh, attitude. Yeah. And, and, and there is another risk. We compared our data with uh, Tala from Ireland, and that was presented at WAST virtual meeting a couple of days ago, where they do the two stage. They did the uh, ERCP first and then cholecystectomy. And from their data, over 100 patients included, there was a 22% risk for readmission because the gallbladder with the stone, the reservoir was still there. So there is actually a risk of leaving the gallbladder with the stones and waiting for the uh, definitive care, which is uh, cholecystectomy. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the argument that we, a lot of people have. But, uh, in, in our unit, we, we try to plan the cholecystectomy right from the start and not wait that long after the RCP. Okay, George, do you have any comment that you want to make on this? I was looking for the, the microphone uh, button. Um, the problem uh, for me, uh, particularly, the problem is uh, to have a ERCP available, uh, uh, like Shane has, to go to the operating room and, and, and do the procedure. Um, having, having it, I think it's, it's uh, amazing and it's good. It's, it's a proper treatment for the patient, and I, I agree with the, with the management that uh, um, that they they did to the patient. Uh, except probably um, that question about surgery earlier than than it was really done. But <clears throat> it's a question. It's a different question, I think. Uh, in my hospital, I only have two gastroenterologists that do ERCP. So they have to take leave uh, one at one, one uh, um, each. And they only do ERCP once a week. We, we can have ERCP in uh, emergency basis during day hours. And if the case is really, really emergent. So what we develop uh, in my hospital was the will and skill to do uh, laparoscopic common, common bile duct exploration. 
said that I don't know if this patient would be a good case to do um, uh, exploration laparoscopically because the terrain, as Shane showed in, in the video, uh, is not really favorable. And uh, doing um, a laparoscopic common bile duct in that condition could be more harmful than beneficial. So probably what I would do in my conditions would be cholecystectomy and ERCP in the postoperative period. Okay, thank you, George. I'm not going to ask that question from uh, Drs. Kin and Gim and Der Virgilio because you're going to cover that in a presentation now. So if you'd like to uh, share your screens and do that, that would be great. Yes, uh, so uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, we're going to talk about this uh, topic. Uh, we decided since we knew that the other panelists were going to focus on uh, acute cholecystitis in the elderly, we would uh, focus specifically on the topic of uh, what to do with common duct stones and uh, expand it a little bit to not just common duct stones in the setting of acute cholecystitis, but also with biliary pancreatitis or with just simply cholecystitis. So uh, when you talk about acute biliary emergencies, uh, there are uh, def several different strategies, as you know, and you know one of them is to uh, perform uh, preoperative MRCP or preoperative ERCP or both. A second strategy is to perform an intraoperative cholangiogram, and then if positive, an intraop ERCP or a lap common bile duct exploration, or perform an IOC and then an ERCP post-op or let me introduce the topic of, depending on the cause of the common duct stone, watchful waiting, meaning leaving the common bile duct stone alone. But this really applies more to pancreatitis. Next slide. Dr. Kim is managing the slides for me. So when you look up at the pre-op uh, clearance of the duct approach, uh, the advantage then is that you don't necessarily have to do an IOC uh, potentially you have shorter general anesthesia times, and if the patient has cholangitis, it relieves sepsis pre-op. A disadvantage is the uh, potential added cost of the NR MRCP and the delay to the OR, as well as the fact that the ERCP, as mentioned by Dr. Shaheen, may cause pancreatitis and or duodenal perforation. The intraoperative approach uh, has uh, some advantages and dis disadvantages as well. And one of them is that it avoids an ERCP if the IOC is negative. But you have to be aware that this requires certain technical expertise that not everybody has. And finally, uh, next slide, Dr. Kim. The post-operative approach uh, has the advantage that it may avoid uh, the MRCP and ERCP altogether and may in fact shorten hospital stay shorten OR time, and maybe some stones will pass. However, uh, one disadvantage, and it may be apropos to this patient, is that if the patient has sepsis from, say, cholangitis, uh, you have maybe perhaps left that stone in place and ongoing sepsis as a result. And so uh, in our view, uh, the decision of how to approach this depends really on the indications for uh, the intervention, as well as the institutional skill sets, as was uh, discussed just recently. Next slide. And so what you really have to ask yourself is, is the intervention urgent or is it less urgent? And in patients who have acute cholecystitis, uh, the indication for cholecystectomy, in our view, is that it's urgent. Similarly, uh, acute cholangitis, the intervention is much more time sensitive. And similarly, if you have the concomitant biliary pancreatitis and cholangitis, uh, these are also more urgent interventions. Although in our own experience, that combination of pancreatitis and cholangitis is very rare. Just like cholecystitis and cholangitis in our experience is also rare. On the other hand, uh, in some cases, the intervention, meaning the uh, cholecystectomy and the uh, cholangiogram and clearing the duct, may not be as urgent in patients who have symptomatic cholelithiasis with some common duct stones or in biliary pancreatitis. 
Uh, in addition, you have to also ask uh, whether the common bile duct itself, clearing it is urgent. Uh, and if that's more urgent than the cholecystectomy, and we would argue that in cholangitis, it may be more urgent to get the stone out of the duct than actually removing the gallbladder, which is more preventing another attack down the road. Uh, and similar in biliary pancreatitis with cholangitis. Whereas in someone who has acute cholecystitis, uh, then the duct clearance and the cholecystectomy may be more urgent. So I think these are important factors in considering which approach to take, as well as I mentioned, your institutional skill set uh, in terms of performing uh, uh, intraoperative cholangiogram and ERCP. So with biliary pancreatitis, let's look at this topic first. Uh, important to note that most common duct stones in these patients pass on their own, and most patients have mild ERCP and uh, mild pancreatitis. And uh, in our view, uh, there's two approaches. One is early lap coli uh, with ERCP uh, only if an IOC is positive. And uh, we've done some uh, prospective randomized studies on this topic, or do you even need to do IOC in these patients? And with severe pancreatitis, we would argue that lab coli should in fact be delayed. Uh, and if you look at the original studies coming out of Argentina back in the 70s, it's interesting to note that in patients who had biliary pancreatitis, stones were found in the feces in 34 of the 36. So this implies that with biliary pancreatitis, most of these stones are in fact going to pass without the need for uh, IOC or potentially ERCP. And in fact, in this study out of JAMA, they found that patients who developed pancreatitis from gallstones typically had very small stones. And so this sort of goes along with the idea that if the indication uh, for cholecystectomy is pancreatitis, many of these stones are gonna pass and it uh, suggests that a preoperative ERCP in most of these patients is going to be unnecessary unless, again, they have concomitant cholangitis. Uh, so in this study that we performed uh, a while back, uh, we actually randomized patients with mild gallstone pancreatitis without cholangitis to either pre-op ERCP or selective post-op. And we found that selective post-op ERCP shortened hospital stay, had less cost, did not have any increase in combined treatment failure and resulted in an overall decrease in the use of ERCP. So we would argue that if the, if the patient has, in fact, uh, pancreatitis as indication, we would not perform ERCP unless they have evidence of obstructive jaundice and simply go right to IOC. And then you have several, several options, either intra-op lap common bile duct exploration, or uh, you could do an ERCP intra-op or post-op. Uh, this is an article that we did with Dr. Kim, and the topic here really is, do you really need to, in patients with pancreatitis and normalizing biliary rooms, do you need to actually clear the duct? And in this study, we compared the approach of our hospital with another hospital, and the topic was in patients with normalizing bilirubin with uh, was it necessary to do an IOC or could you in fact simply do the lap coli and perform so-called watchful waiting? And in the study, what we found was that uh, although our institution routinely performs IOC, our, our sister institution did not. And uh, they found that uh, there was a decreased duration of surgery, lower length of stay, fewer ERCPs post-op, and importantly, without intraoperative cholangiogram and without post-op ERCP, there was a very low rate of readmission for biliary pancreatitis or any other reason. So do we really need to perform uh, IOC in these patients? We would argue yes, but some feel not. So to, to summarize with biliary pancreatitis, it's important to note that in this case, most common duct stones pass pre-op ERCP is really unnecessary. Our other approach with mild pancreatitis is in fact to perform early lap coli within 48 hours with an IOC, and then you can decide whether to do an ERCP intra-op or post-op, or in some cases, simply lap common bile duct exploration. And with severe pancreatitis, again, we delay the lap coli for at least six weeks later. So now let's switch to the topic of cholangitis as in this case. And 
here there's a difference because patients who get cholangitis typically have bigger stones. These stones are not going to pass likely. And so common bile duct clearance is going to be much more important. And here I think it's important and we think that it's important to distinguish the grade of cholangitis according to Tokyo guidelines. And in patients who have mild or moderate uh, cholangitis, it's reasonable to uh, uh, potentially approach these intraoperatively like Dr. Mosseini recommended. However, in patients who have severe grade three cholangitis, our feeling is that following IV antibiotics, fluids, and presser support, uh, they're probably better off getting earlier ERCP. And let's look at some of that data. Uh, and so this study looked at early versus late ERCP in patients with cholangitis, 4,570 patients. Early ERCP was as defined as same day or the next day, and that was associated with a decrease in hospital mortality and decreased 30-day mortality. Uh, similarly, in this study from Denmark, uh, early ERCP within 24 hours was associated with a lower 30-day mortality. Uh, and here, uh, recently, we looked at our national data uh, in the United States, and we found that uh, if ERCP was delayed beyond 72 hours of admission, the risk of death significantly increased in patients with Tokyo grade 3 uh, cholangitis. Uh, in this study, also looking at the elderly, and this is our topic of today, uh, an important thing to also note is that Charcot's triad is quite infrequent in less than 4% and urgent biliary drainage in this study was associated with a low mortality. And so again, our feeling is that with severe cholangitis, uh, our approach would be to perform earlier uh, ERCP followed by cholecystectomy. And finally, in this study, uh, looking at the safety and efficacy of emergency lab common bile duct exploration in the elderly, uh, this takes a counter approach, somewhat similar to what Dr. Mosseini presented, that in patients over 65, uh, it is effective to perform laparoscopic or, uh, in your case, ERCP in these patients with cholangitis. So this is certainly an approach, but we feel it should be in a very select, a very select approach. Uh, in the World Journal of Gastro, uh, looking again at acute cholangitis, uh, this looked at the very elderly patients who were aged 80 or older. Uh, and uh, in this patient, patient population, they found actually a very low rate of ERCP-associated pancreatitis, which is also uh, quite reassuring. Uh, and uh, finally, in this uh, study, looking at national trends in cholangitis, again, if the ERCP, the mortality remained under 1% if ERCP was performed within the first three days uh, of presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, you're going to go ahead and uh, skip this one too. So, uh, no, go back one, sorry. So, uh, you know, the topic then is should you proceed with uh, one stage lab coli and ERCP, or uh, should the ERCP be done pre op? or should the ERCP be done post-op? And uh, Dr. Mosseini and colleagues uh, looked at this, I think, very interesting study uh, where they combined their data with data from Estonia. Uh, and uh, one group, the Erebru group, uh, looked at performing intrap ERCP uh, based on findings on IOC, whereas the group from Estonia uh, instead went directly to ERCP based on CBD stone on pre-op imaging. And uh, of note, uh, this study had 46% with cholecystitis, 30% with cholecystitis, 20% pancreatitis, and 5% uh, cholangitis. And as you can see from the result, they had outstanding uh, results. And I think this is certainly a very uh, reasonable approach, but you have to have the local expertise to be able to do this. And so to summarize with cholangitis, uh, our opinion is that uh, the first priority should be sepsis management. Since the stones are bigger than pancreatitis, it's unlikely that these stones are gonna pass on their own. In patients who have mild uh, pancreatitis, uh, we feel that 
uh, it is certainly reasonable to do an, a, an early lab coli with IOC and then an, an on-table ERCP or lab common bile duct exploration. But our opinion is that if they have severe cholangitis, uh, particularly if it's going to be a difficult gallbladder, it may be safer to perform ERCP first, followed by laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So I'm going to move on. Uh, Dr. Kim's going to take over the next half of our presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. DiVirgilio. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Mosseni as well as the group uh, for having us on. I really appreciate this opportunity. We're going to round out the talk by talking a little bit about cholidocal lithiasis. I'm actually was on call overnight. We were operating all night long, and one of the cases we did was a lap CBD exploration. And so this is uh, one of my favorite topics to discuss, and uh, on a related note to some of what we've been discussing today, and it's been a fantastic discussion, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with Harbor UCLA, we are located in South Los Angeles. We're one of four level one trauma centers. And in my group of now eight full-time uh, trauma surgeons, we cover all of the acute care, emergency general surgery, as well as trauma critical care. And so we see about 4,500 traumas a year and about the same number of EGS. And one of the recurrent things that we see at our hospital is biliary tract disease. And so when we were handed these cases, I, I thought it was really interesting because as a resident, I was always taught that you come in with a diagnosis of acute coli or cholangitis or cholidoco or gallstone pank, uh, but it doesn't ever overlap. Well, in fact, when we looked at our experience here at this hospital, we found that about 10%, one in 10 patients who are coming in that undergo a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, in fact, have some combination of biliary diagnoses. And in fact, this puts them at an increased risk for conversion, probably not surprisingly, as well as an increased risk for bile duct injury. And, you know, when I say that we're a gallbladder center of excellence, like really no joke, we kind of take our, our gallbladder disease pretty seriously and we like to write about gallbladder disease and we take care of so many patients with this problem. And, you know, when we look back on our experience, what we realized is that we had a significant proportion of our adult patients coming in with diagnoses like cholidocolithiasis as well as gallstone pancreatitis, which as we've already heard oftentimes requires the expertise of colleagues like GI. The problem with that, and again here you can see about 35% of patients uh, over this short course of a year and a half came in with this problem of which 50% uh, required an ERCP, and this was already alluded to. This is the GI schedule here, all right? So you might be lucky if your patient shows up on a Tuesday. So if they wait until they're sick enough to show up on a Tuesday, they might get an intervention done Wednesday or a Thursday, but heaven forbid you show up on any other day because you're gonna be waiting. And so this really drove me and motivated me and our group to really get interested in how we can offer services to our patients that doesn't involve extraneous or consultation services. You know, I'll tell you, a lot of our GI endoscopists, and I don't want to generalize, but they like doing their screening gastroscopes and their screening colonoscopies. ERCP is a high-risk procedure. And so when they could be doing all these back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back outpatient cases, and then you ask them to do an ERCP, which may or may not be indicated, uh, it's sometimes a little difficult to wrangle them in. And if you actually look at the ASGE guidelines, and these were just updated last year, 2019, they've got about 14 recommendations going from weak to very strong evidence and one of the things that they kind of bury in there is that we recommend laparoscopic common bile duct exploration, and we do them all transistic here, not via the common bile duct, is an alternative to ERCP as a first line strategy for CBD stone removal in the setting of symptomatic cholelithiasis where surgical expertise is available. And I think this term surgical expertise gets overplayed a lot because there's really not that much to it. 
And when we talk about doing an actual laparoscopic CBD exploration, outside of having the equipment and the training and the personnel to do so, there are a couple of key things that we do want to identify. We don't do MRCP here. So if a patient comes in, they've got a mildly dilated duct, or they've got a mild bump in their bilirubin or other LFTs, provided that there's no other emergent indication to decompress their biliary tree like cholangitis, they're gonna go to lap coli with IOC. And this is typically what we wanna see. Ideally, we'll see a CVD of at least six millimeters, a cystic duct of at least four, and we can dilate that up. And uh, here's an example of a positive IOC. And there's only a few key steps that are involved with doing this outside of the cholangiogram. This is our setup last night, took a picture there. And again, you wanna gain and maintain wire access. If you need to dilate the duct, do so. And there are several kits out there on the market that come with everything pre-packaged and ready to go outside of the scope. Cholidocoscope insertion and maneuvering, you're gonna find and grab the stone, complete your cholangiogram, and then ligate the cystic duct. This is uh, not the highest res image. This was from last night. This is a solitary stone that was in the CBD. We've got our night and all wire, just kind of pulling it out here. And this is so much fun to do. All right, I'm telling you, if you can do this procedure, it is a blast. Woo. Nice. Everyone gets excited. You know, there's no waiting for another team. There's not another day in the hospital. So this patient came in on Saturday. I was on call yesterday. We took her. She's going home today. If we didn't perform this procedure, she would be getting an ERCP probably tomorrow, followed by her lap coli, which we oftentimes don't do at, in a sort of ambulatory setting, which means home Wednesday. That's two whole days spent in a hospital with a whole lot of COVID patients around unnecessarily. So. And here's an example of the IOC. So this was the IOC uh, initially, and you can see there's absolutely no filling of the duodenum. We've got nice lighting up of the left and right hepatic, nice distended CBD, no leakage of contrast. And then once we pull that stone out, we get a completion clangiogram. We've got filling of the duodenum. Patient is good to go. Here's another little video of a solitary CBD stone that is gonna get grabbed with a wire and pulled out. Again, the views here are just fantastic. And with the newer scopes, the resolution is just absolutely incredible. This is a lucky catch here. They kind of just deploy, pull, and it's there. It's not usually that simple. And so when it comes to elderly patients, what's the data? Well, there's a lot of data, in fact, just like there are RCTs, prospective randomized trials, a Cochrane review. We know that lap CBD is just as safe and effective as alternative strategies like a two-stage or a one-stage lap coli with ERCP, either pre or post-op. When you look at elderly patients, this is a study comparing greater than 70, greater than or equal to 70 versus less than. And Outside of length of stay being longer, there's really no other differences in terms of OR time, bio leak, and they actually had pretty good five-year follow-up in a lot of patients. And when they actually looked at stone recurrence, not statistically significant between the groups. This is another one. This was actually not transistic, and that's how we do them. We do a laparoscopic transistic common bile duct exploration. This was actually transcholidocal. And I do have some friends throughout the country who are doing this. And even with this approach, they had similar outcomes. Now, I think many of us in the past, when we think about CBD exploration via a transcholidocal approach, we always envision a T-tube having to come out, which kind of is that same problem as having a cholecystostomy. But these days, most people are just putting an anti-grade stent through the actual sphincter at the time of the transcholidocal and then closing it primarily laparoscopically. So this in the right hand, not mine, but in the right hands is a, a great approach as well, particularly if you have more than one stone 
or very uh, large stones. This would be a, a great approach or stones that are more proximal in the left, right, or uh, main hepatic duct. And again, just another study showing that uh, this is equally efficacious and safe in elderly patients. This is the protocol that we developed, and this is pretty much based on the ASGE guidelines. So when we have a patient coming in with symptomatic cholelithiasis, if they've got very strong predictors for a CBD stone, we refer them to GI. This is evolving and changing as we've gained experience with lap CBDE. But in general, if someone has a CBD that's greater than one centimeter or 10 millimeters, or a total bile on admission of greater than four, and or cholangitis, they'll still go through that old pathway. Otherwise, they go to lap coli with IOC. If that's positive, they get a very cool exploration and the surgical team has a lot of fun. Um, similar to Dr. Mosseini, who presented some excellent work, Dr. Bast uh, did a great job talking about the single stage lap coli ERCP. We're presenting a quick shot next Friday. Don't wanna give away all the data but essentially we looked at our experience and of about 208 patients with cholelithiasis, about a third of them went for a lap CBDE. So this is our experience over the last few years. And again, we excluded all those patients that wouldn't typically fall into our pathway. And what did we find? Essentially, when you go for a lap CBDE, the OR time ends up being a bit longer. And again, there will be some um, impact here in terms of a learning curve. But in fact, when you look at time to the OR and hospital length of stay, both on the uh, unadjusted as well as adjusted analyses, laparoscopic CBD exploration patients have about two days less time in the hospital with no difference in complications. So we're super excited about this and it's something that we're really uh, pushing and again, this was my experience with the first 40 patients, and then I stopped collecting the data. But you can see when you're first doing this and you're learning the equipment and getting the workflow down, it can take a while. And so there is a learning curve there. It's a shallow learning curve. But eventually, we were able to get our times down to the point where it does not differ between the two trips to the OR followed by the endoscopy suite. So in terms of final thoughts, and Dr. DiVirgilio, I'll have you chime in here too again, and we've already heard this, there's no one size fits all approach. And I think that's one of the great things about this topic of uh, elderly patients with biliary tract disease. And I think this is where a, a lot of the actual kind of fun and mental intelligent work comes around when we're trying to risk stratify and actually have some in-depth conversations with our patients their families and their loved ones, because oftentimes this should be a shared decision-making approach to management and what's best for patients. But just remember, a quarter of patients who don't have their gallbladder out at the time of their index admission will have some complication as a result of that within the first three months post-discharge. So we got to get these gallbladders out. Again, concurrent biliary tract disease is also pretty common in our series is about one in 10 patients. And if you look at the data, whether we're talking about straight up acute cholecystitis or the management of cholelithiasis with a laparoscopic CBD versus laparoscopic chole and ERCP approach, outcomes are looking pretty similar. Dr. DiVirgilio? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Estes for this kind invitation and Dr. Mosseini for his invitation. and. Uh, Nice to team up with uh, my colleague, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you once again, everyone. We really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting tour de force from the pair of you. Can I ask you the obvious question of what, what caliber of cholidocoscope do you use and how often do you find that it's too big to get in the cystic duct? Yeah, so we have the Carl Storrs digital scope and uh, it fits right through our five millimeter port and it's got an introducer sheath that comes with it. And I gotta say for the most part, the vast majority of patients that we're taking, we already have a good sense that their common bile duct is gonna be enlarged as well as their cystic duct. And so even if the cystic duct is only four or five millimeters, so that's the diameter of our actual Olsen clamp, we can dilate that up by another two to four millimeters to accommodate the actual cholidocoscope. 
Do you ever find that it's that the scope is too big to get in the uh, cystic ducts? Yeah, yeah. And when that one happens, key... what do you do then? Yeah, so one of the key tricks there, if you're going to be embarking upon this, is you want to make your ductotomy as close to the CVD as possible. Um, you know, the more valves you have to deal with to try to navigate your way through the cystic duct and into the common bile duct, uh, the more frustrated you're going to get. We always, always, always recommend a trial of conservative medical therapy before embarking upon a lap CBDE. So every patient will get a couple milligrams of glucagon. We will attempt to flush the distal stones out of the biliary tree. But I gotta say that's usually ineffective. And so, um, yeah, you know, every now and then you, you, you find a tough cystic duct. Thank you. Abe, do you have any comments to make? Your microphone's muted. Yeah, didn't want to hear me coughing. Um, um, yeah, I'm very happy to see that uh, la laparoscopic uh, common bile duct exploration has, has taken off, uh, especially in the United States. I've been uh, an advocate of this uh, technique for many, many years here in Europe. Um, and uh, even though I admire the fact that you've gotten that done uh, very often through the cystic duct, uh, I, I would say in our experience, we uh, more often than not we were going directly through the uh, through the main bile duct with the uh, with the ductotomy uh, and the rules that uh, 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 everybody knows about uh, doing a, a ductotomy. Um, but yeah, so once again, I, I'm very much in favor of laparoscopic uh, common valve exploration for these things. Yeah, yeah sure. we have a uh, few people uh, throughout the country right now that are doing the transcholidocal approach and essentially with a bursi knife making that incision. But most of them are more advanced laparoscopists and MIS surgeons who are really facile at intracorporeal suturing. I don't mind putting a couple stitches into a perforated duodenal ulcer, but uh, the patience it takes to be able to knot tie and, and close a, a common bile duct securely. I think a lot of folks these days, when they hear about common bile duct exploration, um, it's still kind of intimidating. And I think we've been told as surgeons for so long to stay clear of the CBD and don't bag the CBD and you know, let our endoscopy friends take care of it. We've just kind of been indoctrinated into this thing. Like that's not our territory. And so I think with the transistic approach, it's a little bit more digestible or acceptable to, to, to folks. Okay, I get agree once again, but uh, uh, just like to insist on the fact that we as laparoscopic surgeons have to know how to suture and do not interrupt corporeally. <laughs> that's something else that I've been a, um, a very vivid uh, advocate of for many years. Yeah, absolutely. I knew that was coming. George, have you got any comments to make on this? You're going to go out and buy a Colidocoscope? I already have one. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, in this, in, uh, we, we have a lot of problems with, uh, with equipment and material and, and, and uh, the hospital finances and, and so on. And in, um, I think it was two years ago, we published a, a, a small case series where we used um, an Ambu bronchoscope mm -hmm. to perform colodocoscopy, but uh, we don't do it, uh, we don't use it uh, uh, um, uh, through the cystic duct because uh, usually it has or four or five millimeters. These are the, the, the diameters that we have, the ambuscope. So we usually do a cholecotomy and, and, and use it through the cholecotomy. We have a, a kind of a ureterorenoscope that is very long, but we use it when we, when we do transistically and uh, it has works very well for us and I think we are going to continue unless in fact that uh, it's it's impossible in any way to, to, to perform it uh, uh, via laparoscopy. 
Yeah, I've broken a, a couple of our urologists' ureteroscopes in the past couple of years. <laughs> they are really big, and we have to to put our arm uh, very high so we can manage it. It's very very difficult. But well, what, uh, one question I had is, uh, you know, there's a recent study that came out in the journal Surgery that talked about minor bile duct injuries being more serious than we think. And I wonder, you know, in terms of long-term follow-up, uh, is there any repercussion from a cholidocotomy uh, in patients? Have these, been, have these patients been followed two, three years down the road? Um, we don't have a lot of, of, uh, of patients. Uh, we probably have some that are already in the five years uh, of follow-up, but there are not a lot of patients with uh, with this with those characteristics that I, I could say that we have a um, a answer to your question. In fact, but uh, we have the care that we don't do a cholecystectomy in a patient that has a cholecystus with the, the minus uh, 12 millimeters, only 12 or more millimeters that, that we do the, the, the cholecystectomy. Otherwise, we try it transistically, and if we are not able to do it, it, it the patient does an ERCP pause up. So honesty time, what's your, not necessarily for you, George, but uh, for Dennis in particular, what's your failure rate for doing uh, your uh, cholecystectomies? Yeah, so early on, pretty high. It was probably, you know, every fifth one had some difficulty and then learned a new trick in terms of how to hold things and how to do things. Um, when we looked at our data over the last few years, now combined to 70 plus patients, um, the failure rate's still around 5%, but the incidence of retained stones doesn't differ with the ERCP technique. And all the patients that we failed to remove a stone, GI was able to successfully remove that stone postoperatively. We did have one patient where uh, a basket actually broke off in the CBD, but we were able to retrieve that fortunately. Okay, does anybody else want to comment at this point? I, I just wanted to 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 congratulate Kim uh, on the on the timing, because I, I I do feel that we are still in in the learning curve because our timing is not uh, comparable with the uh, with uh, the um, with that of the the, the cholecystectomy. It's really not comparable. You have. Um, an average around 100 um, minutes. And I think we, we usually uh, spend more than two, two and a half hours to make the, 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 the common bile, bile duct exploration. So I think um, that, that graphic with your learning curve sort of saying is, uh, is very good. And I think we are still in the middle of that curve. And, we have a lot to work in the, in the, in the future. Okay, that's great. I think we have had a very, very good session this evening with some excellent presentations, and I hope it's been very instructive and educational for the audience that have watched it. We've now actually run this webinar for two hours, so I think it's about time that we drew it to a close, or that I drew it to a close. We've had a fabulous backstage crew without whom we'd not have been able to do this. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Alan Bilislavo, Hayato Carriara, Diego Mariani and Mauro Zago for their help. I'd like to thank my co-host Shaheen Mazzani who's done most of the work on this. Our excellent panelists, George Pereira, Abe Fingerhut, Christian de Virgilio and Dennis Kim. And thank you all for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and will join us in two weeks time for an Estes webinar on humeral fractures in the elderly and in four weeks for challenges in visceral trauma management, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Details of, details of future webinars can be found on the events page of the Estes website at estesonline.org. And you can also access this and previous webinars on the Estes YouTube channel. Hope to see you all then. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>